Moving uh, to our next um, keynote speaker. It's now my honour to introduce to you um, our next speaker, Dr Jackie Huggins, AM. Dr Huggins, or Jackie, is Bijara in, in Birigabajuru from Queensland. Dr Huggins is a leading voice for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country. And we are most grateful to Jackie for her ongoing engagement with FRSA and delighted that she accepted our invitation to speak today. Jackie has been a trailblazer at many times through her life. It was during Conference 2015 that we were able to screen her Remembrance Day commemorative address, the first Aboriginal woman to do so. Of course, Jackie was in Canberra and we were in Brisbane at our conference, but Jackie had been with us only the day before, facilitating the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Practitioners Forum Day. Jackie has been a highly impressive and effective advocate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Jackie was the National Coordinator for the Aboriginal Women's Unit in DAA in 1984 and on the Steering Committee for the Aboriginal Women's Task Force, which produced the Women's Business Report. She was co-commissioner for the inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. She was the first Indigenous woman to chair the Queensland Ministerial Council for Domestic Violence and on the Indigenous Reference Group for 14 years, Centre for Domestic and Family Violence Research, Central Queensland University, CQU in Mackay. In honour of this work, she was granted an honorary doctorate from CQU in December 2017. Today, Jackie's role is as co-chair of the National Congress of Australia's First Peoples. The National Congress advocates the self-determination of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, believing that families, communities and organisations must be at the forefront of policy decisions made by federal, state and territory governments. We now welcome Jackie to the stage to share her vision for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people into the future. She will be speaking to the theme, putting our voices at the centre of delivering services in our communities. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr Jackie Huggins AM. Please welcome. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Good to be here in beautiful Cairns and have our wonderful brother, Henry Formile, welcome us to country. Thank you. I pay my respects, my deepest respects to your elders, both uh, past, present and future. And Henry, in the great work that you and your family particularly do in this region around um, uh, the the vibrancy of our people and being on country. And what a wonderful video that was to show us that boomerang just circling around, going towards the, the, those places that we know um, largely by their European names, but um, as we know, have had a very long abiding and deep history here for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Uh, the oldest living culture on the planet of which we can all be so very proud of. Um, I'd also like to um, uh, thank FRSA, Mike, and to Jackie, um, uh, particularly for inviting me here to uh, do your keynote around an issue that's uh, at the heart of, um, of, I think, where we are placed today in our country in terms of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and our, our deep uh, longing, longing to close the gap that, uh, that exists uh, between us in, on so many levels, on so many levels. I'm going to um, talk about children, families and communities that lie at the heart of so much that is important to us. And uh, I'm very, very pleased to be here to speak at your gathering. Now, I realise that you all do such important work, such important work in your areas, in your jobs, etc. But we can do better. We can do a whole lot better to close this gap. A little over two years ago, I stood with a strong group of national leaders of Aboriginal peak bodies during the federal election campaign to try to focus the attention of our nation's leaders on the pressing needs and the rights of our peoples. 
On the 9th of June 2016, we delivered a statement to the media, our politicians and the nation. It was a statement that called for government to work in genuine partnership with us. A statement to respect our knowledge, our expertise, our rights to self-determination. The statement was delivered at the NCIE in Redfern, and so some 23 years after the then Prime Minister Paul Keating delivered his Redfern speech just down the road from where we were, we delivered our own call for justice, called the Redfern Statement. Many of us had watched with horror just two years earlier as the government of the day ripped more than $500 million out of the Indigenous Affairs budget, rolled out 150 programs into five overarching areas, and implemented a new competitive tendering process for our organisations to compete in the open market to deliver services to our communities. Many of us were tired of decisions being made for us and for such little attention being paid to our voices, our experiences and our rights in the national scene. What government didn't seem to acknowledge or value was the fact that we, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, have the solutions to the problems facing our communities. And I'd like to show you just two very short um, segments now. Thank you. Redfern Statement offers a blueprint for change. For far too long, there have been numerous reports that have gathered dust in the halls of Parliament, Canberra and other places. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people deserve much better. It's time for Australia to address the burden of trauma that has been passed down from generation to generation among our people. Trauma affects the way that we think, act and behave and comes at enormous social and economic cost. At least 50% of all Aboriginal people have some form of disability or long-term health condition. Yet despite this, the needs of the vast majority of Aboriginal people with disability remain largely unmet. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander incarceration rates are worse now than at the time of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. 
Our young people between the ages of 10 to 17 are 26 times more likely to be in incarceration than their non-Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander counterparts. Aboriginal family violence prevention and legal services turn away up to 30 to 40 per cent of women contacting our services for their safety because our work is significantly underfunded. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children are being removed from their families, culture and their communities at almost 10 times the rate of non-Indigenous children. It's a national crisis. However, we believe that we have the solution. We have the solutions to the problems that are faced by many of our people in our communities. We have the solutions. 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 We know in our communities that we have the solutions. We have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peak bodies who've been working with communities and individuals for 30 and 40 years. We're asking the government to listen to us through the Redfern Statement so that it provides a better future for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Thank you. Unfortunately, two years ago, we've seen very little shift in terms of policy, in terms of uh, uh, better collaboration. Uh, we feel that uh, those were the members of our peak bodies who have been engaged in this for 30, 40 years, as I said on the, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the video, that um, uh, things, of course, uh, proceed sometimes in glacial pace. And uh, we hope that working together with organisations and groups such as yours to really get a grip on this, we can actually uh, progress uh, where we sit. In 2014, the federal government rolled out the so-called Indigenous Advancement Strategy, an open tender pro process to deliver services to our people. We were deeply concerned for how this would impact on our services and our communities. Concerned for what it would mean for continuity, for planning, for meeting our community's needs. There was no consultation with us prior to the design of the strategy and our organisations had just six weeks to apply for funding. The Indigenous Advancement Strategy shifted to a competitive tendering process that was completely different to how our organisations had previously been funded. And many were unprepared for such a change. They had little experience in such uh, a lengthy uh, application process and were unsure of whether or not to apply. Unsurprisingly, given this process, only 45% of recommended grant applications from this initial process were Indigenous. Great upheaval and uncertainty was how the Indigenous Advancement Strategy was described by the then Social Justice Commissioner, Mick Gooder. It is, I think, important to reflect on that strategy and process when considering how Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are engaged and empowered or not to develop and deliver services and solutions to our communities. That strategy not working with us, it was doing things to us. The truth is that the strategy was another example of us having decisions and actions imposed upon us with little attempt to work in genuine partnership and value our expertise and experience. And I'm glad to hear uh, Minister Landry talk about uh, the change and the inclusion and the way in which um, groups such as ours, disability, women's groups, etc., um, are going to absolutely, you know, be at the forefront of some of those uh, 
some of those policies and decisions making. Th thank you for that. And I do thank um, Minister Scullion uh, as well for um, assisting us with the Redfern Statement workshops and, and rollouts there. So there has been um, you know, some shift and some change there. But this has been the plight of our people for the past 230 years. Decisions that have been made by others about our lives. Yes, we have resisted, argued our case, broken through on a number of occasions, and there has been the odd exception. But history has overwhelmingly shown that control, empowerment, and our solutions and our voices have been overlooked and devalued. If someone was to ask me why we haven't had much progress on closing the gap in disadvantage for our people, I would tell them that this lies at the very centre, that we won't close the gap until this tendency, this impulse to impose solutions and approaches on us without our say is addressed. This devaluing of our voice was the front um, and in the front of the mind of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander delegates in the 18 dialogues held by the Referendum Council in 2017, which was established to consider reforms to our nation's constitution. I had attended six of those national delegates, uh, delegations. The process culminated in the Uluru Convention, which delivered the statement from the heart calling for constitutionally enshrined First Nations voice to Parliament to review legislation, make recommendations, and have a say to Parliament on policies that affect us. The speed at which the then Prime Minister rejected this reasonable proposal was extraordinary. Just two months after the final report of the Referendum Council was delivered, he shot the idea down. This rejection was at odds with his own words. In 2016, he said in his closing gap report to the federal parliament that essentially it is time for governments to do things with Aboriginal people, not do things to them. He went on to say, to build autonomy and independence, our task must be to engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians in partnership that is based on mutual respect. We have learned over many years that this is not the words that count, but the actions that follow those words. The immediacy of the Prime Minister's rejection of the constitutionally enshrined First Nations voice to Parliament was at jarringly odds with these words, as have many other decisions that have been made. The Prime Minister used the words autonomy and independence. These principles have been at the centre of many of the efforts of our people to have control over our lives. We call it simply self-determination. Self-determination isn't just idealistic. It isn't just an idealistic human rights speak. It is real for us. It is practiced and pursued in practical ways at national, state and community levels. In 1970, for example, following years of police harassment and incarceration of Aboriginal people in Redfern, a group of Aboriginal activists and lawyers established the Aboriginal Legal Service, a legal service comprised of and controlled by Aboriginal people for the Aboriginal community. The Aboriginal Legal Service was the first organisation to provide specialist legal services and support to Aboriginal people. It was an Aboriginal solution to an identified problem impacting on our community. It was also the first free legal service anywhere upon which mainstream legal aid was modelled. Although grossly underfunded, there are now Aboriginal legal services in every state and territory, and a national representative organisation making the case for support for the sector and an address to the highly, highly problematic incarceration of our people. Similar to the Aboriginal Legal Services in 1971, the first Aboriginal Medical Service was established. Again, 
an Aboriginal solution to the health issues facing our community, by the community and for the community. Today, there are over 150 Aboriginal community controlled health services across the country. The greatest gains in closing the gap in health outcomes have been attributed to those services. The Aboriginal community controlled health sector provide around 3 million, 3 million episodes of care each year for over 300,000 people each year. In a recent speech, my good friend Pat Turner, the CEO of Nacho said, it is imperative that a person's health be considered in the, con in the context of their social, emotional, spiritual and cultural well-being and that they, they are part of that community. We know that being able to better manage and control your own affairs is directly linked to improved well-being and mental health. This holistic, culturally centred approach is not something Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people find in services outside of those that we run. But I believe the approach can be applied to many areas of our daily lives, not just health. Like most people, we need to feel welcomed, understood, valued and listened to when we access services. And often, that means we choose to go to an Aboriginal run and community controlled organisation. There are many examples of our voices, our solutions, our initiatives being supported and enabled through Aboriginal controlled services. They are, of course, usually dreadfully underfunded. There are childcare and family support services and family violence prevention uh, legal services, for example. Again, culturally embedded community control service providing the solutions to the issues that we face. But it has to be said that relative to need, these sectors and the number of services are small and under-resourced, much like I would suspect some of your organisations as well. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, like other citizens, continue to access mainstream services all over this country. Hospitals, GPs, housing, family support and childcare services. But institutional racism still lies at the heart of many of these services. So how can we work together with those services to ensure they are listening to our views, are responding to our cultural needs and are accessible to our communities? How is it that we can feel welcome in those services? And how do we ensure that they are not displacing or disempowering our own organisations and solutions? One solution came after the upheaval of the Indigenous Advancement Strategy process when the Aboriginal People's Organisation of the NT called APONT, A-P-O-N-T, was concerned that the open tender process had overlooked many Aboriginal organisations, had disempowered them or placed them in an unfair footing to, compute, to compete with larger NGOs accustomed to and resourced for applying for grants. APONT worked with organisations like the National Congress of the Australia's First Peoples, of which I co-chair, ACOS and others to develop a set of principles to guide non-Indigenous organisations on working with Aboriginal communities and not competing with them for funding. Sad to say, uh, this is the fact and has been the case and in, uh, in any good initiatives uh, uh, that we've seen have, uh, have folded, have ceased due to lack of funding. These are important principles that I'd like to encourage all of you, your organisations in working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to consider in your planning. And uh, could I advise you please to go and look up the APONT, A-P-O-N-T website and some of those supporting principles um, working with non-Aboriginal organisations um, go like this. And I'll quickly run through them. Okay, first one is to consider 
their own capacity. Non-Aboriginal organisations shall objectively assess whether they have the capacity, either in service delivery or development practice, to deliver effective and sustainable outcomes. Recognise existing capacity. Non-Aboriginal organisations will recognise the existing capacity and the strengths of Aboriginal NGOs and identify how they can contribute to further developing this capacity. To research existing options, non-Aboriginal organisations shall thoroughly research existing Aboriginal service providers and development agencies before applying for service delivery contracts or prior to considering community development projects. To seek partnerships where there is an Aboriginal NGO willing and able to provide a service or development activity, non-Aboriginal organisations shall not directly compete with Aboriginal service provider, but will seek, where appropriate, to develop a partnership in accordance with these principles. And that non-Aboriginal organisations will be guided by the priorities of the Aboriginal NGO in developing a partnership. To work together with viable Aboriginal people to create a strong and visible and viable uh, Aboriginal organisations for service delivery. To ensure Aboriginal community control, not just consultation. We are very tired of this word. After my 40 years in the business, I, I continually get consult. Um, consulted about uh, what we want to do. And whilst that's very important, please make it work. Please make it implement. Please implement that consultation. Non-Aboriginal organisations agree that Aboriginal organisations need to be in the driver's seat and have control of development initiatives, service, services and programs delivered to their communities. This should um, have included input into decisions regarding resource allocations and staffing. To develop a clear exit strategy, I don't need to explain that, and to ensure a robust uh, and uh, effective evaluation and accountability. The last one I want to say is around cultural competency. Please, if you don't hear anything else, please hear this, this uh, plea from us that your organisations act in a, in a respectful and ethical way in terms of the cultural competencies of our people and the services that you are delivering. Now, I realise that many of you are doing all this right now, aren't you? Thank you, yes, I get a few nods. <laughs> well, if you aren't, come and see us. But Congratulations. I know that there are some great organisations in this room and all over Australia that uh, actually do the right thing. But as I travel this country, I can tell you uh, it's not 100%. We hear this all the time. But I'm confident that if all organisations working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities considered these principles and approached them with good intentions and in the spirit of a genuine partnership, then services would improve, and the well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people would improve. Together, people, we could effectively close that gap within the next 10 years or so, rather than the 495 years that we see will take at present to close that gap. And that's been research done by Monash University. I think it's at least incumbent on all organisations to consider how their services cater to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, where the needs across all social and economic indicators are the greatest. And we know that there are many. We heard the Minister talk about um, uh, detention and child protection, uh, family violence, and that rings true. How are we to welcome everyone to those services? What issues might be impeding us in accessing them? How are our views heard and acted upon? And how are we made to feel genuine partners in those services? 
I said at the start that children, families and communities lie at the heart of so much that is important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and to you all. Recently, I was very pleased to be asked by June Oscar, our Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, to accompany her in her consultations for the We Annie You Thangani Women's Voices Project. It's a major project that she's undertaking which involves travelling around Australia to speak with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and girls about what is important to them, their key strengths, their aspirations for change, and it is designed to capture and elevate our voices and our, identify our priorities for long and lasting change. And there are many challenges, a long way to go, that we face. We are 34 times more likely to present at hospitals for experiences of family violence. Nationally, we are the fastest growing prison population for Aboriginal women. 80% of those women are mothers who have families, who have communities. Our children are almost three times as likely to die before the age of four as other Australian children. And we know all too well the connection between the out-of-home care, juvenile justice and the criminal justice system, each of which being a, a predictor of the other. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are also a young demographic with a rapidly increasing population estimated to reach 1 million, 1 million people by the year 2030. So amongst all of what I've spoken to you about is the fact that uh, we need to really pull this stuff together and work together. Uh, one of the uh, issues that I heard around the country with June Oscar was that um, the dissatisfaction with the IAS and how non-Indigenous organisations were disempowering Aboriginal organisations in the take-up to that. Finally, I encourage you to follow the work of this most important project from the Australian Human Rights Commission to hear our voices and our views and consider how we might best work together to shape your services. I ask you to work with us, with our services, forge partnerships where you can and challenge yourself and approaches by considering how the APONT principles can apply to you and to your organisations. Nothing could be more important to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people than our children, our families and our communities. Thank you for listening to me. I applaud the work that you're doing. Uh, keep it up, but please, let's do some better work together in overcoming and closing that gap. Wadamuli, thank you very much. Jackie, thank you so much for that really powerful presentation. Now, we do have a few minutes for some questions. We've got mics set up here and here, so do we have a, a question for Jackie? While you're thinking about your question, just a couple of reflections. I think, um, firstly, that, that Red Ferns, thank you for sharing that, that film with us, and I think that strong message of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people have the solutions. I think sometimes that sense of... Um, People think, well, what do we do when we don't, we don't know what to do, and yet the solutions are, are, are available. Um, and I think those APON principles are, are... I was scribbling madly as you were speaking to try and keep up with it. That's APONT? That's APONT, yes. Yeah, APONT. So I think those... OK, so those principles that you articulated are all available on that, on that website? Yeah. yeah. Um, now, we've got, um, we've got a question for Jackie. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Jackie. I'm Catherine Spinney from Centre Care in WA. Um, I guess I'm interested in your thoughts around, you talked a little bit about capacity, and where there's perhaps reduced capacity in Aboriginal NGOs, yeah. sort of balanced against where contracts are getting incredibly complex, mm. different funding models, outcomes measurement, what I guess we're concerned about is we're seeing that the, to build capacity, 
is not moving at the rate of the complexity of the expectations. So how do you see or what are your thoughts around connecting or the bridge between having the solution but having the everything in place to build capacity both from a workplace perspective, a workforce perspective, um, you know, to manage the complexities. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah. I, I just want to, just clarification around building capacity. Who is this for? The organisation for the yes, Indigenous? Yes, I guess for both. I mean, we're finding mm. even in our organisation some of the challenges and where we have a number of partnerships with um, Aboriginal NGOs and mm -hmm. We see both for not just Aboriginal NGOs but across the board, but I guess where um, there's a real desire to, you know, for Aboriginal NGOs to provide those services, I guess where do you see the capacity and what needs to happen to have resources to support those NGOs because we currently don't see that. So for an example of workforce development where yeah. we have partnered with one particular NGO that their policy is to employ um, Aboriginal uh, workers mm -hmm. and just they struggle to get skilled workers or to have workers where they can then build those skills. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, part of that I think is if you have, and I hear this all the time, you know, we don't have the people with the educational qualifications or the, you know, skills and so forth. I think it's really incumbent upon that organisation to, uh, uh, to train those people up where they can, you know, to give them the, and, 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 and provide the, um, and really to provide the, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, what's, what's the word for it? Um, the, uh, uh, you know, ability for those people to um, be able to, um, it starts with M. Come on, people. <laughs> mentor, mentor. Yeah, well, that's that's probably a good, a good, a good thing. Yeah, to mentor, but to you know, drive through capacity to those people because we know that our Aboriginal medical services, legal services, but particularly our medical services and so forth, have um, a, a great um, workforce in their Aboriginal community-controlled health workers. You know, people who, by large, don't have the um, have the uh, pieces of paper or the, you know, uh, the um, academic qualifications to do that. But they are, um, they, they are mentored, they are um, uh, given opportunity to, you know, attend conferences, but also to, uh, to uh, be provided with uh, uh, some training as well, you know. And, and, and uh, I think that is, um, that, that's really important for organisations to uh, allow people to you know, to, um, uh, to be able to do that as well. But I think it's incumbent upon your organisation to, if you get people in like that, the um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, to, you know, really uh, to service them as well. Because, as we say, at the heart of the whole issue is that um, they know their communities. You know, they have doctorates in their own, um, in their own communities around um, social, emotional health and wellbeing, mental health, uh, issues and working with communities, and please use them. Um, um, Minister and I were talking about the elders in relation to the great strength of particularly women elders in our communities, and I've seen that, we all see that. Women are the, um, the backbone of our, our communities, and, um, and Brother Henry will tell you that, and every other Aboriginal man. <laughs> um, that, that is the case, you know, use those people as well. I mean, we're all so, so gracious, but I think where, where the uh, rubber stops is that uh, Aboriginal people are, are getting pretty worn out, you know, through the, through the process of trying to um, work in their own communities, but also in, in service industries. Um, and to build capacity, I think it's really important that, you know, the service provider provides this in whatever way they can, you know, and you will get that back tenfold uh, with, the, um, uh, with the employment of your Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, I'm sure. Thank you. A quick, if he's got a quick one, I think we're nearly on time, but a quick Jackie, one. Jackie, uh, yeah. Frank Bannon, Catholic Social Services. Um, thanks for reminding us about the Redfern Statement. Given the silence of government about the Redfern Statement and given government rejection of the Uluru Statement, what would you urge us as citizens to be doing? 
particularly in the lead up to an election next year. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think you should, uh, if you can get yourselves uh, informed, and there's plenty of ways that, that you can, you know, write into your politicians. I mean, that's that's a very, I think, a very effective way of um, uh, getting politicians to uh, acknowledge the issues um, and to know that um, uh, that's, uh, you know, that's probably going to be uh, important in terms of how people vote in the next election. I think. Um, uh, we, we're, we're hoping that we will do another, uh, I don't know if it's a doorstop or a, um, a, another uh, project like the Redfern Statement for the next elections to say that, okay, this is a report card, this is how much you've done, this is what needs to be done. The Uluru Statement's very important because it came from the, um, the heart of Aboriginal people. And when we, told, uh, when we told government what we wanted and what we wanted to do, they said, no, thanks, we're not going to have that. So, you know, we're very... Very disappointed of that. We ask for the, that uh, good citizens yourselves, you know, keep pressing on that. I think there's petition out there, done by Cass Goldie and um, Fiona Stanley, that have over 30,000 signatures on that. Get on top of that too, you know. But keep pressing that, um, you know, we are, we're still here, First Nations peoples. We're not going away, but. We need to close this gap as soon as possible by all working together. That's the only way I can see us doing it. By all, you know, working together, respecting um, and, and uh, really acknowledging all ourselves. And, you know, I, I look for the day where I can properly call myself an Australian. I really, really do. I look forward to that day and I hope that uh, that comes before my lifetime ends. But that's not going to be for another few decades. So. Um, hopefully, um, you know, we can open our ears and open our hearts in relation to the plight of our people and where we need to drive this. And it's got to be through people such as yourself, through governments, through stakeholders and all decent people, all decent people in our country that believe in the power of, of goodness to one another. Because as I say, you know, there's only one race of people on this earth, isn't there? There's only one race of people. And it's the Aboriginal race. <laughs> Got to crack you up with some humour somehow. <laughs> of course, it's the human race. But uh, thank you, people. I hope that we can all work together. Thank you.